Our research project is a coalition of researchers who are political scientists, anthropologists and policy scholars. And it came about because my colleague at the Hansard Society, Ruth Fox and myself, um, concluded that development studies scholars don't really interact enough with politics scholars. And so what we wanted to do was study the politics within countries where development happens in a very central way rather than making it a kind of tangential part of the project. So we decided to um, so we decided to have as our overall research question, what is the interaction between Parliament and the public when aiming to reduce poverty? And one of the interesting aspects of this is that we assume we need a really strong democracy for poverty reduction. But we picked two countries, Ethiopia and Bangladesh, where you've got poverty reduction on some measures, um, but a, a democracy that's in a some ways getting weaker. There's now no opposition at all in, in Parliament. So what does that mean? And what are the risks of not having a, a deep and strong democracy? Um, so we've been um, working with our colleagues and our, it's the national researchers who are basically doing all the research and they're talking to parliamentarians but also a very wide range of stakeholders both in parliament and in constituencies to find out how they see the relationship between MPs and other people in society when they're doing various things, when they're making policy, when they're making law, when they're uh, making a budget uh, but also when they're interacting within the constituencies and finding out what they make of all this. So the project started in 2014 and will run till 2017, um, although one of the benefits of this fund is that it's flexible and you can actually talk to the people in ESRC DFID. So for example we can explain that there's been political turbulence in Bangladesh, there's been an election which interrupted the research in Ethiopia, so we may get an extension. My background is as an activist, an NGO activist. So I've always got in my mind not necessarily a plan of how you're going to achieve impact because I think at the beginning of the project you often don't know what opportunities are going to come up but also most importantly if you've got within your project um, a serious consultation with all kinds of stakeholders then you're not going to know yet what it is that they want you to disseminate engage with people about um, or influence, or even try and influence them. Um, so we, we phrased our impact in an extremely broad way for that reason, to allow that kind of um, ideas to bubble up from all these different stakeholders, including citizens and constituencies. So we aimed to stimulate debate about democracy in those two countries. And really the emphasis of um, our various events and outputs and briefs and whatever uh, is not dissemination as if we've got an easy, tidy set of findings which we're going to send out to people. Far from it. Um, the, the researchers in our coalition don't all agree with each other about what our findings are, in fact. So we start by debating them ourselves, but then we will run a whole kind of series of different um, encounters and produce all kinds of written materials but also we've got a sort of digital strategy because fortunately the Hansard Society is absolutely brilliant at engagement. So for me it's more about engaging with people to stimulate debate rather than having a pre-planned pathway for impact uh, where you fantasize about the kind of impact you're going to have. Some of the changes that have happened to those two countries have sort of accelerated some of our top-level findings, I think, uh, because the, the, the fact that there's now no opposition in either parliament and the political space for civil society is shrinking further and further and you don't have a free media in, in either place, and in both countries, there's a very, there are very deep divisions between people, either based on party or based on ethnicity or class. Um, 
because of all these things, um, I think we're concluding that even if you can have some poverty reduction without a really strong democracy, if you don't satisfy citizens' expectations for democracy, there's a, there's a very serious risk of conflict. So, as, so the biggest change probably that's happened in both countries is that they've both become more uh, turbulent in the case of Bangladesh, tense in the case of Ethiopia. So in a way, the, the urgent imperative to do something about democracy in both places is probably to prevent conflict, rather than to bring about economic change according to very narrow macroeconomic measures. Um, the other thing that I've personally realised during the course of the project is that actually what we're doing um, is a form of scrutiny. Within a very important part of democracy, obviously, is, is scrutiny by all kinds of actors. And uh, I've done work, uh, research myself on, on the UK, so I've seen how important the media is. But I've also seen that you can't leave scrutiny just to the media. The media, as in particularly you know, journalists, but also bloggers and whatever, get very entangled in, in politics themselves. And they have a very short-term view of what's going on often. And they get, they get drawn into debates that are sometimes quite antagonistic and form very close relationships with politicians and, and very often they take sides. So I think it's really important in the UK, but perhaps even more important in countries where you don't have a free media, uh, to have researchers not just coming up with findings about policy issues, but also scrutinising what politicians are doing. So I make it my personal responsibility in the, in the project to create the space and the opportunities and support my colleagues uh, in those two countries because there is no way that I could scrutinise politics. I would fail to understand, I wouldn't have the political knowledge to be savvy about what can be said and what can't be said, but also it's not sustainable. You know, I live in the UK. So increasingly, um, and I don't think this is just true of political research, I've become really passionate about the idea that, that UK researchers should make it their business um, to support and not undermine uh, national researchers. So this, this needs to be taken to a very practical level. So if you put aside overheads, then uh, my colleagues control something like 55% of the budget, whereas Ruth Fox and I control around about 10%. And a lot of that is for meetings between us. Um, in terms of intellectual property rights, I'm not going to publish anything about this project that's about the politics of those two countries or a comparison between those two countries. Um, certainly not on my own. Uh, if my colleagues want me to, because politically it's easier for me to, then sure, I'll, I'll do that. Or if they want to put my name on publications, but uh, that's fine. But as far as I'm concerned, it's their knowledge. Um, and I will help them get into international journals if that's what they want or produce policy briefs or produce that kind of um, those findings in ways that uh, hopefully will have influence on people. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, the ownership of this research and the decision making about how to interpret things is in their, is in their hands. And, um, the only time I have uh, insisted on uh, taking a decision about the way we do the research, uh, which took a longer discussion uh, and was kind of pushed by me, was that I insisted, because all the lead researchers in Bangladesh and Ethiopia, there are three, because they're all male, I insisted that the quality of the research really depended on having at least one woman researcher in each team. And that took a little bit of conversation. But um, they have gone ahead with that because we have a spirit of um, working in an extremely collegiate way and we negotiate everything. And so by coming to that kind of agreement and, and me having to make the argument about how research is profoundly affected by the identity of the researcher, um, we, we went ahead with that. One of the ways that I persuaded my colleagues that this was important is we ran a little experiment. 
Uh, so there were four of us at one point in an encounter where we were having a conversation with a caucus of women MPs in one of the two countries. And we were a, a white man, a white woman, and uh, a, a black or Asian, I'm anonymizing this, black or Asian man, a black or Asian woman. And we had this amazing conversation. But it, for most of the time, um, these MPs were behaving like politicians, isn't it, telling us what a wonderful record their government had and how they've been making huge progress towards gender equality. And that was fine. But by prior agreement, we had uh, decided that the male researchers would leave the interview just before it ended. And so my, my colleague, so the most senior one in the room really was the, the, the guy from Bangladesh or Ethiopia. So, uh, so they left, the men left, and we're, we're, we had a, uh, a moment where we sort of eyed each other up a bit, and uh, one of the women MPs um, said to me, so tell me about the experience of women in the UK who were in Parliament. And I said, well, yes, it, it's worth saying that in the House of Lords, actually, women really thrive, they love it, but in the House of Commons, where the power is, women have an extremely difficult time. It's quite a, a hostile place, and they get really demeaned and disparaged by the media. So I'm certainly not here to tell you everything's wonderful in the UK and that you need to copy Westminster. And they all looked a bit relieved. And then they started talking about what it's really like being a, a woman MP in this particular country and how they have some male allies, but other male MPs are furious with them. They say, you know, why are you always moaning and crying? Why are you making such a fuss? Our constitution guarantees the rights of all our citizens. Why do you try and create divisions between men and women? What you're doing is, is uh, impeding poverty reduction, not helping it. Um, and I said again and again in different ways, you know, so what's it like being a woman MP? How's it different from being a male MP, do you think, in your country? And that the, the most redoubtable woman, I mean, this woman was a, a whip, and uh, she was really, clearly extremely uh, intelligent, and I assumed very confident, but she said, she said, the main difference between being a woman MP and a male MP in our country is if you're a woman and you stand up to give a speech in Parliament, you tremble. You don't know whether or not you're going to do the job well. That's how you feel. Whereas a man would never think about that. And I thought, well, how interesting. I'm not sure I can believe that all the men in this parliament are super, super confident. But how, how interesting that she, like I think lots of women in positions of power, including women academics, struggles to have the same kind of confidence as the men. And so um, this conversation went on for an hour and a half. So we finally left, um, and my male colleagues were amazed <laughs> that they'd had to pace up and down in the corridor for so long. But I think when we explained the conversation to them, I think they thought, oh yeah, that, actually that is quite interesting, because as the senior man explained, he knew he had several students amongst these women MPs. And he said, you're right, actually, because there's no way they would have told us those things with me present, because it's very difficult for women in, in this very patriarchal society to show weakness in front of men.